So while we're waiting for Andrea to, is she finding her way to us? So it's now a six hour difference, right? To uh, Israel? Yes, yes. Um, so Noah, will you just tell us when the next election is and what number election this is in the last two years? I can't even keep so, track. So, um, <clears throat> so this is the, the fourth election uh, since April, 2019. Uh, and uh, it's gonna be held next Tuesday. Um, we don't have early voting, so it's only the one day. Um, and it's going to be interesting. And let me tell you, uh, the, the date of the fifth elections is already, uh, we're already calculating it. Uh, and that's probably mid-September. Oh, my God. It's not, you can't know for sure because you don't know the delays, but it's, uh, that's, uh, that's the estimate. What September? What did you say? When in September? Mid-September? 15th, what? yeah. I think September 15th is Yom Kippur. Well, that makes sense. Yep. We all could benefit from a little bit of yeah. soul searching. Oh, yeah, yeah. So Mark Lerner is asking, what is it based on? How are these elections timing been determined and why? So, so what happens is there's an election and then um, they, st they try to form a coalition. So there are multiple parties, 13 that have a chance of getting in. And uh, after the elections are called, they're trying to form a coalition of 61 out of the 120. Um, so the first step is that the president of Israel, which is a mostly a symbolic so figure. Pause for a second. So the 120 are the seats in the, in the Knesset. So there are 120 members in the Knesset. So in order to have a majority, you need 61 of the 120. Why are there 120 seats in the Knesset? It's based on the number of seats in the Sanhedrin which is adorable, but really annoying. So you have to get 61 seats to get a coalition. Go ahead, no, I'll, and be, the, I'll be your- I'll be You'll, your, you'll be my, my translator. Yeah. And so what happens is all of the parties go to the prime minister and they, rec uh, to the president, and they nominate the first person to try to form the, the government. And that takes usually about a week. And then the president gives it to somebody, one of the heads of the bigger parties. And then that somebody has 28 days to try and form a coalition and then 14 more days if they fail. And if they fail, the president may give it to another person to try 28 more days and 14 more days. And then if another election is called in three months. So that's why it takes uh, this amount of time. All right, I think Andrea has joined us. Yes, yeah, so this is why with the coalition system, it makes it so complicated to form a government and to maintain the government. And how in this current in this current Knesset, for instance, Noah, before the election next week, how many different parties are represented in the 120 seats? Uh, eleven. So there are eleven different parties. So that's may well, the funniest. Uh, thing when you're in actually, Israel. actually, um, if I could dive in, oh, running. Hi, hi. Sorry, we're, we're I feel just, like a total moron for. You not checking sorry, the time. We didn't, we didn't warn you about the time. <laughs> that's our, that's our okay. call. Right. Yes. No problem. No she problem. Have the time um, that's not fair. Right. So hold on. Let me just let's pause and no, we will. Sorry. Okay. We, we were just schmoozing. Go. So let's just pause and now we'll formally start. Welcome, Andrea. Okay. So Thank you. <laughs> the next is the next Israeli election is next week. So we thought this would be a wonderful time. And I hope everybody got, I just got a delicious everything bagel with some great lox and cream cheese. And I hope everybody got their schmear and it was all set for our breakfast together. Is a chance just to talk a little bit about this this fourth election in the Israeli cycle of these last two years. And we've invited um, a couple of people from CBST's uh, world in Israel to help us understand a little bit about what's happening. So I wanna welcome everybody who's here. The first person is CBST member Andrea Wine, who lives in the Tel Aviv neighborhood of Israel. And Andrea has lived in Israel for a long time. Maybe Andrea, when you speak, you'll introduce yourself a little bit and tell how long you've been in Israel. And Andrea has been, I see Andrea often when I'm in Israel and Andrea has been very active in the, in the uh, Yesha Teed party, uh, but is one of our CBST members in Israel, which is wonderful that we have, we have a growing membership in Israel actually now. And Rabbi Noah Satat is joining us today from Jerusalem where she lives with her family and is the um, uh, executive director of the Israel Religious Action Center, which is the primary uh, arm of the reform movement 
which works on issues of religious pluralism, but Rabbi Noah Satat has primarily been involved in their anti-racism work in Israel, which has really been transformative and very, very powerful in trying to deal with the racism within Israel, all of all different kinds. And so that's been primarily her work, but she supervises many, 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 many lawyers on staff, which do a lot of advocacy and work both in the Knesset and in the Supreme Court. And her, the most recent case that many of us heard about of the conservative movement or the non-Orthodox conversions being recognized in Israel is a result of her lawyers doing that work. But many, many of the progressive cases in Israel are done uh, by the Israel Religious Action Center or ACRI, the, uh, the uh, kind of the ACLU of Israel, or in some combination of their lawyers working on, especially issues related to racism and anti-racism, religious pluralism, the rights of immigrants, uh, and things like that. Things that would be very near and dear to our hearts. And so many of us know um, uh, Noah from our interaction with her in Israel and here in New York, where she comes as often as is possible. Okay, so we're gonna start with Andrea giving a presentation and talking about what's going on. And then uh, after Andrea speaks, Noah will offer any uh, thoughts or responses from her perspective. The Israeli political system is very, very diverse. CBST is very diverse. So, and then afterwards we'll open it up for questions. But I think if you have questions while they're speaking, just put them in the chat and then I'll, uh, and Rabbi James uh, and I are hosting today. We'll uh, figure out how to do the questions, maybe even, uh, so just if you have questions, put them down, but we won't go to the questions till after they both speak a little bit, okay? So first for the uh, main presentation from Andrea Wine. Welcome, Andrea. Sorry about the time change. <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry. Um, yes, I, I, I already will say that I wanna speak from the heart and the mind. I don't have a formal presentation. Um, I feel really strongly about what's going on right now in this election. It is critically important election and I'll address that issue in a moment. Uh, about myself, I made Aliyah 10 years ago. Um, I grew up as I think some of the CBS people, uh, CBST people know in a very activist Jewish involved family. So when I got to Israel, um, I got involved in startups and I have been um, reviving uh, Israeli art museum and doing a bunch of things. But when I started to understand the politics, I thought that was the place for me. And uh, I arrived in 2010. In 2011, there was the social justice movement and demonstrations which drove um, the creation of the Ishati party in 2012. It was one of the answers and responses to this outpouring of um, sentiment about the need for a more just society, about widening social gaps, about the contract between the rulers and the ruled. So I dived into Yeshati. I am the um, manager of the English speaking branch. We have 150 branches now around the country. Um, and I'm candidate number 79 on the list of 120 candidates, which means I have zero chance of being elected, but it, uh, that doesn't matter. I am pushing for the biggest vote we can get for Yeshatid. Um, I know Rabbi Noah from her work. I know Iraq. I am a um, passionate supporter of what they do and consider uh, all of that work vital, groundbreaking, important. My path has been a little bit different because I guess you could say I'm, I'm, I'm a bit more uh, focused on how do I get my result and the result that, I, and how do I define the result I want? And my result, the result I wanted was regime change because I saw it as the overarching solution to all the smaller problems that are so big and so across the board that they exhaust the available number of people who are willing to be the fighters, okay? So um, 
in 2013, I was super happy at the Yishatid result, 19 seats for a new party. Never had happened before. And a government created without the ultra-Orthodox parties inside. Within a few months, there were, uh, we were on the path to civil marriage. We were on the path to equality in uh, serving the country. We were on the path to what I considered to be all the right uh, steps to take for not just the, 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 the social issues in Israel, but also what I call the unity of the Jewish people issues, which is align the forces within diaspora Jewry with uh, Israelis. Um, unfortunately, after about 20 months, due to a big clash in the government over what's called the nation state law, uh, both Tzipi Livni and Yair Lapid were fired from the government and new elections were called. Uh, all the positive changes that had been either already put into law or were on their way to being law were rolled back by the government that Bibi put into place, Netanyahu, in 2015, the most right-wing government uh, in Israeli history, which I'm sorry to say, may lead us today to an even more awful um, extremist, homophobic, racist, uh, non-pluralistic, and actually non-Zionist government that we've ever seen. And it may not be obvious how you folks can help, but I'll end my remarks in a couple minutes with saying how I think you can help, okay? Um, do you want me to explain the system of elections and so on, or, or Noah maybe started to explain it, or you know it, or? Uh, she started to, but, but yeah. feel free to, go ahead. I mean, okay, so basically- a very new and obscure system. Okay, so those of you who are frustrated by the US system whereby winning the popular vote is not enough to become president, in Israel, it's a hundred times more complicated what you have to do to actually become prime minister. So there are, first of all, many parties. There are many parties, maybe because two Jews, three synagogues, or maybe because at the founding of the state, which is still young and evolving, there was no other way. But a political tradition started whereby you had pop-up parties, niche parties, two kind of large parties, one on the left, one on the right, uh, personality parties, all kinds of parties that came and left and, and stood in the way of the will of the let's call it the will of the majority from prevailing in the kind of government that was formed. Why? Because you need 61 seats to get in, to get to form the right to form a coalition, but parties don't get 61. So you have to unite with other parties. And if you try to imagine, say the democratic party, which is a broad tent from left to right, so to speak. Imagine the Democratic Party having six parties within it, each one with a party leader, a constituency, and a need for horse trading and pork barrel, okay? And then you have the Republicans with the same. That's, that's, our, 12, that's our 12 parties, which means they're all small, one who, which is you know bigger than the others, who tries to, in a corrupt manner, put together some kind of agenda that everybody can sign on to, which means compromise, but okay, politics is compromise, but it also means under the table promises and selling out on your voters and um, abandoning things that you held firm to. All of which has led to all kinds of changes over the years to try to fix either those problems that it's really complicated and time consuming to create a government after the campaigns are over, but also to the people being extremely cynical about politics. And today's cynicism about politics is 
astronomically problematic. Uh, it means that if somebody comes along, and I believe Yair Lapid is that man who is driven by the right instincts and stands for the right things and has grown and matured as a politician and has evolved on issues even more than he would have guessed nine years ago to really be the best chance for change at the top, no one believes him. The amount of time it takes to convince one person is, it's awful. It's not that the, you know, 15,000 volunteers that we have aren't willing to do it, but it shouldn't be that way. There's no Trust, I was on a panel last night where someone said, I think we should fire all 120 MKs. But I know from personal experience that many of them are outstanding public uh, uh, um, representatives of the public and really have their heart in the right place. So it distresses me to hear day in, day out, day out fighting for a really good solution not a perfect solution for everyone, but a really good solution that people may not vote because they're fed up or, um, or they don't trust anybody's word, not, not at all. And um, it's driven by this need to form a coalition because most of the campaign is not issues-based. It's not discussing what people stand for. Most of the parties don't even have a platform. We have a 275 page, uh, page platform divided by into 30 topics where we present every single thing that we believe, want to do, and pledge to do if the voter will let us do it. Likud doesn't have one. Yamina doesn't have one. It has, you know, buzzwords. So, so in this, in, this is a direct result of the system. Okay, this is a direct result of the system. And, and it's certainly not going to change in this cycle. So we're gonna have an election next week and we won't know for a long time who's actually gonna lead the government. Um, uh, the the um, polls are showing at the moment that Likud will be the largest party, but may not be able to form a coalition based on what the other parties are presumed to, uh, to be getting. If Netanyahu can get the math right, and get 61 seats, meaning a bunch of other parties whose percentage of the total vote gives them that percentage of the 120 seats, he can form a government. We're right on the edge. We are right on the edge of one or two seats are gonna decide this election. If the Likud and Bibi Netanyahu cannot form that coalition, uh, then my party will be tasked to form because we're the next one. We are 20 seats and rising a little bit. Um, the coherence of the coalition that BB is looking to form is horrifying. In my opinion, it's not a Zionist coalition because it has two Haredi parties who I don't have to tell any of you how uh, they are taking us on the path to theocracy, Iran-like theocracy, all because they support Bibi. They don't care about anything other than their agenda and Bibi will do anything to stay out of jail. His trial starts on the 5th of April, by the way. Um, so they are his partners. They are not Zionist parties the last time I looked. Uh, Itamar Ben-Gvir didn't serve in the army his folks didn't serve in the army. They are, aside from homophobic and racist and Islamist, like theocrats, they're not a Zionist party in my book. Mansour Abbas, who leads the Muslim Brotherhood Party, is not a Zionist. So that coalition will all depend on a fellow called Naftali Bennett, who is sitting on the fence, who is hungry for power, he has failed to do much in politics in many years. He's the kingmaker. On the other side, we have Yeshatid, who can form a government with uh, the two alternatives on the right, with people like Avoda, Meretz, um, Blue and White, if they all get into government, because there is a threshold, 3.25% 
of the total popular vote. If you don't get that, your party disappears. And that's why of the, I think it's 36 parties running in this election, most of which will just get a handful of, of votes of the, the, the dozen that um, we need to look at and study. Um, a couple are really on that edge, okay? Uh, so, so I'm worried. I'm worried what the next Likud government will bring us. Uh, I, I'm, I'm very worried, okay? Which is why we've redoubled our efforts. We have a lot of obstacles to, to grow as Yeshatid. And as I started to say before, I think that lovers of Israel, lovers of the unity of the Jewish people for whom that's an overriding value and which underpins the security of Israel. Okay, our enemies are within, they're not from without. Okay, this election must bring a Yeshatid led coalition government. We are in the first month, we will bring legislation of term limits starting now, not after, starting now. We will introduce equality for all the streams of Judaism. We will bring full equality to the entire population. We will make sure that the LGBT community has full and equal rights, surrogacy, marriage, whatever you want. We will fix the conversion nightmare. Now, I think I'll let Noah talk about that. Um, we have a Corona recovery plan, which is based on a certain number of things that have been done in the past in post-war situations that got Israel back on its feet. And we will change the discourse from one of delegitimization of the other to, to, to intelligent, sane, liberal government, which will strengthen Israel as a Jewish and democratic state. We only reject parties that don't accept Israel as Jewish and democratic state and the Muslim Brotherhood does not accept Jewish and democratic uh, 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 Israel is Jewish and democratic state. We will um, do a whole host of things that will make diaspora Jews proud and not ashamed of who runs the country and what the country stands for. So that's it. Andrea, thank, thank you so you. much. Sorry. Thank you, Andrea. Thanks so much. Rabbi James? So you've already answered a couple of the questions that have been coming in in the comments, um, especially about the, the threshold for getting into the government and what happens that those votes just disappear if a party does not get that 3.5%. Um, right. And this idea of term limits that, I, I know there have been other parties that have wanted that to happen, but it just has not quite gotten there yet. Um, well, one of the questions Rabbi that came- James, Rabbi James, sure. let me interrupt for a second. And uh, the new head of Avodah, the Labor Party, has spoken at CBST, uh, Meirav Michaeli. And recently, I don't know, Asaf, if you caught this in the Google alerts, she talked about CBST in a speech she gave where she talked about uh, having been at CBST for Friday night services and meeting a lesbian rabbi uh, at CBST. Um, so Meirav Michaeli, who is really also someone to watch in her leadership of the struggling Avodah or Labor Party, um, she's really trying to revive it. So it's another significant party to be watching as well. Okay, Rabbi James just wanted to- Just to highlight in terms of the um, of the threshold, the 3.25 threshold, and to talk about the craziness of the, um, the dividing uh, number of votes between complete insanity and uh, democratic society, which is something that you know a lot about. The yeah. threshold is 3.25%. Currently, there are four parties that are just above or below the threshold. For example, Meretz is 3.28. Benny Gantz. Hold on just a second. Just that Meretz is the left party. It's the civil yes. rights party. Go ahead. Yes. Benny Gantz is 3.4. Uh, the uh, 
uh, religious Zionists, which is the Kahanist party, is 3.3. And Ram, which is the Islamist Arab party that supports Bibi, is 3.1. So anything could happen. The two left yes. wings could be out and the two right wings could be in. The two, it could be the other way around. It's just, it's, it's very, very open. And we, will, we may not know into... Fr and Friday is Pesach, so there's a chance that we will oh, not know yeah. going into Pesach, we will not know the results. We, we the, the, the votes are all on our little pieces of paper, okay? Um, it's not computerized until... That's probably the, a good thing. Um, I don't know. I, I have been a, a, a poll observer and a counter, okay? Uh, making sure that there's no cheating. And um, it's... For the startup nation, it's bad news. There's a 35 step protocol of how you open the envelopes, how you remove the little piece of paper. If there's two stuck there, if somebody put a little dot on it, it's disqualified. You count them, you recount them, you put them on pegs, you put it on a piece of paper, you put that in a plastic folder. Eventually you put it in a big black 100 liter garbage bag. It gets locked and sent to the central election committee which then enters all that into a computer. It is a disgrace and a nightmare. And that's why indeed in a close election, you're gonna get the result alivai by Pesach, but could right. be after because the parties are so close. And, and as recently as yesterday, we learned that the Likud has been instructing its activists to either uh, lie when they get phoned for a poll saying that they will vote for blue and white so that blue and white thinks it's doing better than it is and will therefore not um, leave, uh, 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 will not pull away its slate, leaving those voters to vote for someone else. And they're also saying to certain communities, okay, Likud's going to be the, the biggest we want you guys to vote for the Kahanists to make sure that the Kahanists get to 3.25. Yeah. So how, how you can, you can have the most brilliant campaign strategists and the best speeches and the best of everything, but it's very difficult to, yeah. to play the game that way. Very, very difficult. Yeah. And we have a lot of red lines. So let's go to some questions because our folks yeah. have asked a lot of great questions. Rabbi James. Okay, go, shoot. Go a lot of great questions. Um, and, and I want to just apologize in advance. We're not going to go in exactly the order they came in, but we'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, please speak a little about the ethnic following. Um, I'm going to say not only of Yesha Teed, but of the different, how it breaks down among political parties and whether Mizrahi Jews are part of um, these efforts. And the was a question about whether the past inclination of Mizrahi Jews to lean to parties on the right, whether that's changing at all. Okay, two very good questions. Uh, Yair Lapid is absolutely Ashkenazi Jew, um, child and grandchild of, of uh, Holocaust survivors and victims, um, very well-known media personality with, yeah, I think you could say this, if in the old days people wanted to stereotype, you'd call him you know, a typical North Tel Aviv Ashkenazi. But as a matter of fact, from the beginning, the party had many more Mizrahi than Ashkenazi people in the top uh, 20. So if I look in its candidate list, if I look today, we have Merav Cohen, uh, uh, Merav Ben Ami, Mayor Cohen, they're all from Morocco. We have um, three uh, candidates of uh, Russian speaking you know, origin, all who came from um, former Soviet Union. Uh, one is a woman, Deputy Mayor of Carmiel, very proud that we have um, about 50-50 between men and women in our candidate list, uh, no matter how you slice it. Karine El Harar is Mizrahi, um, the number one advocate for the disabled and the rights of children in Israel. Uh, we're, we're loaded up. So I think that this is um, a uh, 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 incorrect branding that, that is not based on the facts, but I have heard it in the past. And when, and, and 
when Yesh Atid was created, people who felt threatened used that as a kind of um, delegitimization that we were just a, you know, oh, yep. so a, that's an Ashkenazi you, party, but no. I'd like to ask um, Noah to talk a little bit about the historical stuff, because I think most American Jews aren't aware, you know, and somebody also asked about the socialist founding of the state and what was kind of in terms of our images, of Mar many American Jews have this image of Israel as a socialist state founded by the socialists from Europe. And then what happened and what and where, how does this Mizrahi Ashkenazi struggle fit in? And Mizrahi, for those of you who don't know, is the preferred word for Israeli Jews who are from Arab cultures and from Arab countries, like Asaf's family, some of Asaf's families from Yemen. Um, and so the Jews from North Africa, from Yemen, from Iraq, um, and even Iran, which is not an Arab country, but it is a Muslim country. That's a little bit of a that's a little bit of an outlier, but it is a Muslim country. So Noah, do you want to talk about the larger issues? So in terms of, so Mizrahi Ashkenazi politics are still very strong in Israel. And um, the main issue is because there's so much integration that Mizrahi and Ashkenazi are no longer signifiers of your ethnic origin. But for example, our equivalent of the QAnon movement is people saying, this whole trial of Netanyahu, who is charged with corruption, um, and um, three trust. counts of corruption, and, and he is now facing trial, his trial has begun, the evidence part is uh, starting April 5th, and he will have to be in court three times a week. All of this, the thousands of evidence pieces, that there is, it's all an Ashkenazi plot, because they want to take down the Mizrahi leader, no matter that Netanyahu is Ashkenazi, he uh, grew up in the most Ashkenazi neighborhood in Israel, and he went to Harvard. He is the representative. So there, so it's still very much in the political discourse. Um, and it doesn't really, in, in some ways, it's shocking that it doesn't really matter how many uh, people of, uh, of Mizrahi descent you have in your party, it can still create such a lasting impression. I think that that's, in, in that sense, it's not getting better, it's getting worse. The um, the alienation between the Ashkenazi and Mizrahi discourse. Uh, there is a big and shift in terms that's of the kind Russian. Of similar votes. to what's happening in America, the the use of there's there's some similarities, even though it's not the same divisions. But the idea that Trump, who was a New York elite, exactly. you know, is seen very, as, very as, the, as the yeah. voice of yes. ethnic working class, you know, of working class white guys. Trump lived in a golden tower. He was a New Yorker, but he got the he got this. And Nitin, Bibi is doing a similar kind of thing. Yes, uh, Trump was doing a similar that, thing. Nitin, yeah. I was doing it before. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, I think uh, I think it's important to go back to um, the traditional voting loyalties. So uh, the Mizrahis were very badly treated by the Ashkenazis when they came to the young state. Okay. Um, they were sent to the we're middle of the, the desert. 50s, in the 50s, yeah, I'm going yeah. to talk about the 50s. Yeah. And, and uh, in 1977, aside from the Yom Kippur War, um, being a big reason why Menachem Begin was able to flip the power structure from labor to, to uh, Likud, it was on the back of the Mizrahi's resentment towards the Ashkenazi Labor Party. And those resentments are still there. They are still there big time. And in the same way that, you know, my mother shut the TV every time Richard Nixon was on the screen. When BB comes on the screen, I leave the room. Yeah. I, I, I can't see him. Yeah. Okay. Uh, these, these sort of historic um, um, things are still very much there. And unfortunately, I mean, there's a wonderful film. I think it was in the Tribeca Film Festival made by, um, a fellow whose parents came from Morocco, and he uncovered documents from early leaders of the state. Um, I can't remember the name. One of was President Katsia, I, I don't remember, and senior people in the Jewish agency, all saying, oh, they're Moroccan. You can send them to the middle of nowhere. You're not going to let them go to Tel Aviv. All that is still an open wound, and, and, um, uh, and, and you can't Imagine how people just say, I'm Likud because my father was, my grandfather was, you know, etc. So 
And I want to add into the mix, and somebody asked the question about socialism. Also, a million Russians have come to Israel over the course of the last 20-ish years, and many of them come with such a severe anti-communism and a hatred of anything that smacks of communism um, that, uh, as Yelena will testify, here in New York City, we have a lot of the same thing with the those from the former Soviet Union, that they lean very right wing. Um, mm. so that's a million voters that have come to Israel in the last, mm. I don't know when, from the late 80s, I guess, right? Is that when they... Yeah, late, but late there, we, are seeing, we are seeing a big shift in the Russian vote. In the second generation, they're becoming yes. a lot more moderate. Their yes. representatives, the, the Russian party in the Knesset, is now all about uh, LGBT rights and, and women's yes. rights and... Well, a lot of liberal like, values, although they are still very racist against, against Arabs. Um, and, and so we, we are seeing, seeing a big, big shift in the Russian vote. Oh, yeah. Because the next generation didn't experience communism. They grew up in yeah. Israel, mostly. Yeah. So, and, they're, and they're well integrated professionally and, and education wise. So they, but if, you know, I speak Russian, so I get all these polls in Russian and then see the result and I see that um, in the previous rounds, you were seeing, let's say 40% of the Russian vote went to Likud, 40% went to Lieberman, who was what, the party that Noah just spoke about, and we got the rest. But this, this time around, um, we're going to do much, much better with the Russian uh, speakers. And by the way, just as a factoid, um, the Ethiopians mainly vote Likud. Just so that you know, and try to figure that out. Yeah. So it's interesting. I know that, um, for example, civil marriage is one of those those issues in Israel around which there's, you know, maybe an unlikely uh, group of parties that are interested in um, in in sort of sharing power and trying to change things. Um, so I one of the questions was about what is the spectrum of parties from right to left, and which ones fall in which category. Um, but also, I would love to hear about what um, are some of the different approaches to the, the rabbinate um, and some of the problems that are caused by having a chief rabbinate. You've been talking about, um, right, recognition of good, the egalitarian good. parties. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit about that. So, so I, I made this, uh, uh, which will hopefully help us navigate the big picture. Uh, you <laughs> see the wonderful gender diversity in this group of uh, party leaders. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, and uh, uh, I, I just wanna highlight a few things and then maybe Andrea can highlight some others. Um, so you all know uh, Netanyahu who is so the main saying focus. This is all the, these are all the different parties. What is this of, actually a picture of? Just, yes, th these are the, leader. the heads of parties, and I've added a couple more very interesting people that I wanted okay, to Thank you. talk to you about. Um, so this is uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, you all know him. He's, uh, this is his 12th year of, uh, as being uh, the prime minister this time, but altogether he served more than 20 years as the prime minister of Israel. He very much, no. he very strongly opposes term limits, uh, and he... Um, and he, his major focus is um, avoiding trial. And for that, he is willing to, do, to dismantle the entire independence of the judicial arm of uh, government here in Israel. Uh, this is Arya Deri and Moshe Gafni. Uh, there, this, he's the head of the Mizrahi, uh, speaking of Mizrahi politics, Mizrahi ultra-Orthodox party and Ashkenazi ultra-Orthodox party. Both these parties have no women uh, candidates. They're very traditional, very homophobic. They don't have a, an agenda on the Palestinian issue, but they will go with Netanyahu. Uh, Gidon Saar. He, Wait, can I just uh, throw in on Arya Derry? He was he served in prison for um, serious crimes and is currently under indictment. Just FYI, he got back yes. to government, committed the same crimes, and is now under indictment. Gidon Saar. Um, uh, Gidon Saar yeah. Sa is um, very uh, is a very interesting figure in politics. He is kind of what we're hoping to see in the right, which is a um, uh, breaking from Netanyahu with the Trump-like politics of incitement and saying, you know, there's a different type of right wing 
So he's the representative of that. He, he was in Likud for many, many years and he has established a new party. Um, he is, again, very right-wing. His platform is that he will be able to do to the Palestinians what Netanyahu is not able to do because he is focused on his trial. But he is a liberal on many uh, issues of politics and he is, um, he's not corrupt and I don't think he wants to do the harm to the judicial branch that uh, Netanyahu does. Uh, Merav Michaeli, uh, you know, she's a friend of CBSC. She's the head of labor. Uh, as you can see, you asked about history. All, most of these parties are new. The only parties that have, are long-term by name are Likud and Avoda. Likud is still big. Avoda is very Avodah small. Is they got Avoda is labor. Avoda is labor. They had uh, 24 seats in the Knesset in 2015 to 2019. Since now they're standing on six in the polls and they got three seats in the last election. So they're, they've lost a lot of power. Uh, how did it happen? It happened to the left around the world and in Israel it was worse. Uh, Nitzan Horowitz is the head of Meretz. That's the left-wing Zionist party uh, doing very poorly in the polls right now. Um, we're hoping for a change. Uh, Avigdor Lieberman is the uh, leader of the um, Russian right-wing party. Uh, I went to see him uh, after the second elections and I asked him, he's very scary. He has no mimics and no, um, facial, no facial expressions and he doesn't change the voice. So okay. I asked him, how, ma how, how many elections will we have? Okay. So he told me, until Israelis start voting right, we will have election after election. And he was right. Uh, and uh, so that's what we're experiencing with him. Uh, he is, has, he was very homophobic. I'm guessing he's still very homophobic, but his politics has, has changed completely. Um, Kacholavan is was the large was the largest party in the last elections. They had over 30 seats. Now they have, they're they're on the verge of making it. Uh, they'll either have four or will be left out. I'm highlighting here uh, Gilad Kariv, who is my boss, who is running for Knesset. He's number four in labor, and he may be the first reform rabbi. Point out, right? He is a rabbi. He's a reform rabbi. So that's a very big, very interesting. Must be in the kitchen. Um, uh, uh, um, this is Yair Lapid from Yishatid. Andrea spoke uh, extensively about him. He's been building an infrastructure of a party and building his strength and really working strategically for for a long time now, more than most of these pop-up parties. And he really has a foundation that he's built with both in terms of his strength and the mechanism of, it, of his work and in terms of his ability to work with other people. Uh, Ayman Odeh, who's the leader of the Joint Arab List. The Joint Arab List was fractured uh, mostly over uh, LGBT issues because the Islamists and the communists yeah. could vote together on this. Uh, so now there are two Arab parties, one of which is the Joint Arab Party that is in the left, and then the Islamist Party that will vote with Bibi. We don't know if they'll make the threshold. And I just want to say, Ayman Ode himself is incredibly impressive. Uh, I've incredibly met with impressive. him every time I've been in Israel the last few times, and he is uh really uh really 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 impressive great public speaker great politics great leader uh he shows up at their at demonstrations of ethiopian jews and of different kinds of uh he's really really impressive yes he is impressive and the fact that he managed to hold together the communists and the islamists and everything in between for so long was very impressive but netanyahu is just an expert at dismantling the opposition and he was able to do that with, uh, with the Arab party as well. And Netanyahu is campaigning heavily in Arab and Bedouin towns all of the time in order to get, uh, to get the vote out in the Arab towns. Um, these are the members of the Kahanis party um, in what we've seen Kahanis all party. over the world. Just, just say a word about Kahanis, the word Kahanis, what is Kahanis? Kahanis are Jewish supremacists. They're disciples of Kahana who uh, formed the race theory of the Jewish people. Uh, and while in the past, uh, Likud, when we had a Kahanis Knesset member, uh, Likud worked to disqualify him and nobody, would, he only spoke to an empty plenum because nobody would sit and hear him speak. Now Netanyahu has worked to make sure that they get into the coalition and is advocating for them. That's the huge shift that we've seen 
in the extremization of right-wing politics in Israel. That's what Gidon Saar, for instance, is working against. Um, and that's a very, that makes, when the extreme right takes over the right is a very dangerous um, and this is, what the, we're seeing here. this is what decline. we're seeing here. This is very similar to what we're seeing here about will the Republican Party be the party of Trump and a white supremacist? And so these so Khanist parties are the white supremacists of Israel. Or will the Republican or, or will Likud in the right wing be the party of, you know, John McCain? Um, and the John McCain's of Israel are disappearing like they're disappearing here in, is in the United States. I mean, there are real differences, but like in a big, in a big picture way, that kind of gen that, that energy is very similar. Will white yeah. so Vidal Sal is the John John McCain. Right. He was uh, he started this new party. It was very powerful. It's declining in the polls, but we'll have to see how it, how it goes. Naftali Bennett is. Um, is a, the more, more moderate, moderate orthodox party, but he again is extremely right wing. His agenda is dismantling the Supreme Court, um, and so he may partner with uh, with uh, Yair Lapid, but that's a that's going to be a very shaky coalition. Mo it, in terms of how people will again, these are different parties, but the important thing is the blocks. So everybody is decided. It's very clear how everybody will go, except for Naftali Bennett he may switch between the blocks, but currently he's estimated to go with Netanyahu. All right, Andrea, do you want to say we're coming close to our end and this is so, it's really complex because for us Americans, these are new structures, some yep. of them have more or less experience, but it's really, it's sure. helpful for all of us to uh, really focus and to learn more. Um, any right. thoughts? Because we- I, I... I do, I do want to say just two things. Um, I think I agree with, you know, 99% of what Noah said. Gidon Saar is a bit of a mystery because in the past he has not been liberal, um, but he is the kind of nerdy, you know, good values, uh, non-corrupt person we don't know. Uh, Bennett is the wolf in uh, sheep's clothing. Um, oh, I think the Arab parties are important for American Jews to understand better. Um, Odeh voted against the Abraham Accords. The Arab community is not well represented. Their interests are not uh, represented. The, the younger generation by all polls and everything they say wants to integrate. They're proud to be Israeli and they want a piece of the pie. And their leadership from TB to Odeh um, is, not, is not helping them. And they voted against the Abraham Accords, which is overwhelmingly in the Arab population's interest. Not, I do give him credit for, for sticking to his guns on LGBT. I give him credit for that. And Mansour Abbas, who I'm very upset if he gets in, uh, who's you know, just as bad as any of our Haredi, um, he said, I'll kiss the frog if I believe Bibi that my community will benefit by me being in government. So for the Arab community that all of us liberals want to, to, to integrate and hug and so on, this is a very difficult time to figure out how to help them and be part of us. Thank you. Uh, Noah, do you want to have a concluding? And I think this shows we have a lot of interest in trying to understand these issues better, and we're thrilled to have such great CBST representation in Israel. Noah, do you have any uh, final? So I, I, I want to say um, a few things that sustain me. So not, first of all, we really don't know. I mean, it could go, it could go, it, this could be a wonderful opportunity, and we're working very hard to be ready for it if we do have a window it's probably not going to be a very long, um, the, the government, I met with Yael Lapid uh, a couple of weeks ago and he said, if I get to build a government, it will be for 18 months. So we're going to work very hard to make, uh, to, to use this opportunity and it could be awful. Um, there are a few things that I'm encouraged by. One is the protest movement in Israel is really growing um, and Unlike two years ago, we have a huge camp of Israelis that are out in the streets every day protesting for democracy, and they're ready to react even if we have a very bad result. 
Uh, and the second thing that I'm happy about is, which we didn't have two years ago when we started having these elections, is that we have a new US administration and the US has always been one of the checks and balances in the Israeli political system up till 2016. Um, and I am hopeful and optimistic that if we need a balance, we will get that from there. Um, and democracies are fragile around the world. It's crazy how close it is. And we will just have to deal with the results as they come. So I promise to end by saying what all of CBST people can do. So if you have friends and relatives in Israel, get on WhatsApp, get on Skype, and make sure A, that they vote and that they vote anywhere from the center to the left. <laughs> so <laughs> please. <laughs> Well, thank you both so much. Um, and uh, thanks everybody for showing up for our first Zoom breakfast. My bagel was delicious. I hope yours was too. And we love having, uh, we, we could do, uh, maybe Rabbi James and I will talk and the committee will talk about maybe we'll have some more of these, uh, maybe post-election to discuss. Yeah, so so IRAC is hosting a post-election webinar on the we 25th. Are. Yes, so the elections are on, on uh, Tuesday the 23rd. On, uh, on Tuesday the, uh, the 25th, we have, uh, on Thursday the 25th, we will hold a post-election analysis with the results that we will have then. We don't, we're not sure that we'll have the full results. So if you want to sign up, please, uh, I'm hoping we'll have a clear, image, a clear uh, picture for you to look at then. Um, and uh, uh, there's mud. I think we're united around the world in our, these fights to maintain democracy and to recognize how similar the fights are, even in the, the differences that exist, and they're significant. But there is this worldwide, global effort to dismantle democracy. And we all know here in the United States that that struggle isn't over. We won by a very slim thread, let's be clear. And the 2022 election here in the United States is going to determine the future. Um, so we know how slim these these wins or losses are and how democracy is under threat. So I want us here in the United States to feel very deeply connected to the struggle in Israel and to do all we can to support the, vo the forces for good. And I want to thank Rabbi James and the Middle East and Me Committee for continuing to keep. Uh, and we're having a big group go to the virtual J Street conference uh, for those who want to join us. And there'll be a lot of workshops. And I'm sure there'll be a lot about the elections there. And it's a wonderful, it's all virtual. So you don't have to leave your living room this year uh, to go to different workshops. Um, and there'll be a lot of discussion. When, what's the date for that, Rabbi James? I, I don't remember. Uh, it's next uh, April 17th, 18th, I believe, this Sunday and Monday. And that, that will be in the e-news this week with the registration link. So that'll be post-election too. So that'll be an interesting time i'm sure there'll be a lot of discussions and they often have a lot of members of knesset uh speaking and a lot of government and ngos speaking so that'll be a very interesting post-election time um so if you haven't signed up for that and you're interested uh tanya domi is one of the chairs of that right who else is leading that effort and you'd be hollander and Judy carol hollander and carol Feynman are leading our group uh to go to that and thank you, Andrea Wine. We love having your activism in Yeshatid, and we're learning so much from you and really appreciate everything you're doing. And thank you, Noah Satat. I'm so glad we had Tel Aviv and Jerusalem on Zoom. There are some serious benefits to this Zoom world, huh? That we could have Tel Aviv and Jerusalem and all of us here speaking about the upcoming election. So thank you all. Uh, you can Be well. finish your bagel, and uh, I'll see some of you at Psalms class. <laughs>